Hi, good morning. Great to be here. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk a bit about some of the research we've been doing in Aberdeen, uh, but I'm setting this in a much wider context. So I'm an industrial psychologist. My background's in cognitive psychology, uh, really on human memory. And in recent years, decades now I have to say, I've been working with different uh, industry settings, looking at aspects of human performance. And I've done a little bit of work in your world, uh, in the banking sector, working with systems analysts. And I'll explain uh, a little bit about what I did with them. So what I'm going to do this morning is talk a bit about the psychology, talk about some cases. I'm going to draw some examples from different industries. And hopefully you'll be able to make some of the connections with the kinds of things you're doing in your world um, if you're interested in taking this kind of approach, a slightly different approach to enhancing uh, human performance, particularly uh, trying to avoid getting into outage situations that uh, have a significant human contribution or getting out of outage situations where the humans are left uh, resolving the problem. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about um, particularly, I'm going to say a bit about teams, but I'm also going to talk about the, the individual cognitive skills of the people who are in those teams uh, working, as it were, at the, at the sharp end. So your whole meeting's about, about reliable IT systems. Uh, you don't have to look very far to find examples of outages and failures. These are pretty uh, expensive, as you know. People have to work on them at some time pressure. As mentioned, I've worked a little bit in the banking sector with a couple of international uh, banks, and certainly the media are very interested are, as a public when their um, activities are impacted because they can't access the banking system. And certainly in the UK, we're now seeing the banks getting some fairly stiff fines for not having uh, resilient IT systems. So this is very much your world on the technical side, but my question is, um, do we have scalable and reliable humans, i.e. you and your colleagues, who are working on these systems? And I'm going to really take the same kind of diagnostic approach that you might take when you're trying to, to look at system characteristics, how you build systems, how you ensure systems are reliable, how you repair systems, how you identify limitations. I'm taking, I hope, the same kind of scientific approach to looking at the humans who are working uh, in the systems. And there's a whole uh, science behind this, as Robert mentioned, and I, I realize it's not your world and that many of you will not have um, studied psychology or um, other social sciences in the past, but there is a scientific literature and people in those fields have science degrees and science doctorates and use scientific methods uh, to try and study those aspects of human behavior. And I work a lot with engineers, they may be in the oil industry or they may be pilots or they may be surgeons, uh, technical people who really haven't been trained in this area either. But what we're seeing is increasingly they are prepared to look at some of this and to look at how they can apply it in their own worlds to uh, complement the technical skills that these people already have at a, hi at a high level. So if we're looking at safe and efficient job performance, which is really what my work is, um, the focus here this morning is on worker behavior and technical skills. There'll be a lot of that discussed at this meeting. So my piece is on the other bit, the non-technical skills. And I'm not going to talk about organizational factors here, but you would know as well as I do that people's behavior at work is completely affected by the culture of the company they're in, the technology they have available, what kinds of pressures are on them, what kind of organization they're working for. And so this slide is just to acknowledge there's a whole, lot, a whole lot of conditions we can also study and look at how that affects behavior. But my uh, talk this morning is focusing on the human behavior and this particular component that we're calling um, non-technical skills. So what's the background to this? How do people begin to get interested in non-technical skills? This word, this cumbersome term, non-technical, comes from uh, European aviation. You might call these soft skills or something like that, 
not, not really a term I, I particularly like. I found that when we were working with pilots, they seemed to accept the term non-technical, I think because it's the word, it has the word technical in it, so it sorts of sounds okay for men and engineers, and it's not girly psychology of some kind. Anyway, so the background to this comes from the aviation industry. There where in the 1970s a series of accidents, and the one I'm most familiar with is Tenerife, where the two jumbo jets hit each other on the runway. Terrible accident, Pan Am plane and a KLM plane, the, the, it's very bad conditions, it's foggy, there's been a bomb scare, there's many aircraft, the crews are beginning to run out of duty hours, and one plane, the um, Pan Am plane, is trying to clear the runway when the KLM plane takes off and hits it, killing 583 people. So this is one of aviation's worst accidents at the time. When the accident is investigated, of course, there's no technical failure here. The plane hasn't failed. These are very highly skilled pilots. And what's the cause of the accident when they start to look at it? A whole bunch of other stuff to do with how the pilots are performing as a team on the flight deck and communicating with other people who are part of that process. In the US, there were about three accidents, smaller ones, around the same time, none of which, again, had technical failures. So the aviation industry began to get very concerned about this whole body of causation relating to teamwork and human behavior um, on the on the flight deck and began to systematically study that and began to identify what are these other skills that pilots need in order to produce safe and efficient performance. In the UK, it took a good number of years before another accident, a big accident, where a plane on a domestic flight in the UK has one engine on fire and the pilots accidentally sh shut down the good engine with the predictable result. And at that point, our regulator said, well, we've got some research, some, some airlines have started these training courses for non-technical skills, but we're going to regulate this. So in the UK at this point, every airline had to start identifying and training their pilots in these non-technical skills. And now, in many countries, including the UK, pilots are regularly checked on their non-technical skills as well as their technical skills. So this is, the, this is the context I'm going to talk in. And this approach has moved into other sectors. So I've been working with surgeons and other uh, operating room personnel, again, trying to identify those skills. Recently, I've been working with the oil industry, who I have to say, um, hadn't done a great deal on this until uh, the Deepwater Horizon accident in the Gulf of Mexico. And you look at the accident analysis on that, it's full of failures of non-technical skills. And so they too are bringing in quite rapidly this kind of uh, training and assessment. So term comes from Euro European aviation, maybe used in the US as, as well. Um, and it's the cognitive and social skills as well as skills to cope with stress and fatigue that's, that complement your technical skills. So that's all this is about, thinking skills and teamwork skills. The special kind of training the airlines brought in is called crew resource management. And it's sort of two days classroom training plus some simulator sessions, and then they do this on a recurrent basis. And I was involved in some work in, in Europe, identifying what those um, skills should be to get a pan, the big airlines already had done this, but for smaller uh, airlines to, to identify a framework of non-technical skills for pilots. Now, the, the, fr the basic model here is that You've got some kind of problem. In your case, this is an outage. Why do things, why do things go wrong? Why do things not get fixed as quickly as they, as they should done or could have done? And to understand that, you really need to do task analysis to find out what skills do people have, what skills do people need, non-technical as well as technical, and do accident analysis. And also, you can analyze when things have gone really well. Most organizations don't spend much time on that, but it is, it is valid. And off from that, you identify what those skills should be. And then you design the training, and then you do some evaluation to see if this training is working. So this is the model. This is really the, the, the framework that underpins. And this is what's done in aviation. There is continuing research, so they get a new problem, like the startle effect in the Air France crash between uh, Rio and Paris, kind of new, problems seen there when the pilots became very startled and couldn't make decisions, and they then 
they then launch a bunch of research to study what really is this problem and how can we address it and, and train for it. So this is what aviation does. In contrast, this is what I see in other industries, and this may be typical of your industry. First of all, you've got a bit of a problem. Outages aren't being resolved. Your crisis management teams aren't working as well as they should. There seems to be some issue here. So what do you do is you just buy in some training from some consultants on teamwork or crew resource management, and they tip X out flight deck and write systems analysts or something like that. So the kind of training you get is not customized for your world because nobody's done the task analysis to identify, well, if you are a systems analyst team working on a problem, what is decision making? What kind of decisions do you make? What affects that? What other skills do you need? So what they did in aviation is they did a whole bunch of things, surveys, interviews, observations, talk to pilots, because this is all about capturing expertise. The skills we're talking about are not mysterious. They're not some kind of psychobabble stuff that the psychologists dreamt up. These skills are what the best people use fairly consistently. And the rest of us use on a good day, and some people are not very good at at all. And so that's what that we're just trying to capture. What is the hallmark of expertise in terms of these cognitive skills and teamwork skills and how to cope with things like stress? What do your best people do? And have you done the work to capture what these skills are so that you can pass them on in a systematic way? And it's not just a matter of luck as to whether your juniors, your trainees, end up with a good senior person who conveys these skills or doesn't. It's very haphazard in many companies how this kind of special expertise gets transmitted uh, down the generations in the organization. But the big thing they've got in aviation, which is not there in most other worlds, is the cockpit voice recorder. So this continuous two-hour loop can be accessed to tell us what were the pilots talking about 20 minutes before the accident happened or three minutes before it went wrong or as it started to go wrong. And so those analyses are really valuable. And we could say if you've got cockpit voice recordings and you may have calls that are recorded, but do you analyze them in this way? What kinds of things might we hear in your world? So just think about that at this moment. If we were playing through the speakers here, a team of systems analysts, specialists, working on some system outage, and we were, we were just hearing them discuss it, let's say on a call, what kinds of things might we hear that would be indicative to us about how fast they were going to solve this or what kind of mess they were going to get into? And I don't know. I don't work in your world. But if you look at voice recordings and imagine, you know, these are the kinds of things you might hear on the way to some um, resolution that maybe didn't go quite so well, and you could go back through the event, picking up what was happening here, how the team was functioning, why did it, why did it not go as well as it might. And for many people in your world, this is quite time pressured. When I worked with the systems analysts in the banks and I talk about aviation or oil platforms, they say, yeah, that's okay, but nobody's going to die in our world, probably. Um, it's not going to be great for your career, and it may not be good for your company or the reputation or whatever. But actually, the problems are very similar. And the time pressure, I was in the banks, there was always a market opening or closing, so there was always pressure to get stuff fixed quickly. And I think whoever you're working for, that's got to be part of your reputation, is how well and quickly and efficiently you can solve problems. So the, this whole set of work on non-technical skills, Robert very kindly puffed our book. The skills we're talking about are situation awareness, decision making, teamwork, leadership, communications in there as well, and these skills for managing stress and fatigue. And I'm going to take the first two of these and say a bit more about them and say a little bit about the psychology and mention a few events, not from your world, but from other worlds, and maybe you'd be able to draw some of the parallels. And I'd be really interested in the questions whether you can see any relevance here. So this is a skills taxonomy that we've built for surgeons. And it's in a, I've brought some copies. So we identify what the main categories are from a whole series of work with surgeons that's been published in the surgical journals. And we get expert surgeons to tell us what do these behaviors look like when you're watching another surgeon when the surgeon is doing this well or the surgeon is not doing it so well. And we produce these guidebooks uh, 
with rating forms so that surgeons can watch other surgeons um, and give them feedback on their performance. And this is the work I did in one of the banks with the systems analysts. We did exactly the same process of identifying skills, particularly on incident management calls, particularly for the person leading the call. What are these key skills? What do they look like? What do they sound like? How do you train? How do you assess your incidents in terms of non-technical skills if you don't have one of these frameworks available? So this is one of the skills taxonomy. So this is the kind of thing, there's nothing mysterious in there. No surgeon would look at this and say, oh, amazing, gathering information. I never thought about that. That must be useful. These are, these are um, skills any surgeon would know that they needed. So we made these behavior rating systems. We've done a whole set of them. We've done this in the nuclear industry. We're doing this in the oil industry just now for drilling. Um, and so my question that I've kind of posed already is, so what are the skills in your world, these non-technical skills, and in your organization, have you taken the time and spent a bit of resource trying to identify what these skills are so that you have a good uh, framework to work with for selection, for training, for incident analysis, whatever. And this could be skills on the call, it could be how chat rooms are run and managed, it could be when people are just working on the problem. Uh, the skills then, I said a bunch of skills, particularly for incident command, we've got decision making, but before that, we need to have good situation awareness. And situation awareness is really key. And for many people, this term is unfamiliar, I've found. So I'm going to say a bit about situation awareness and a little bit about decision making. And my background, how did I get into this whole uh, area, was a good number of years ago, um, there was a big offshore oil accident in the North Sea uh, I, I, at the University of Aberdeen and the, the whole European, uh, UK bit of the European oil industry is headquartered there. So this is a big industry for us and there was a huge accident one night where one of the oil platforms operated by Occidental went on fire and exploded. There were a whole set of problems identified and one of the problems were that the manager on this platform and on the adjacent platforms did not take good decisions quickly and appeared not to be able to lead under pressure. And I was one of the few psychologists at the time working with the offshore oil industry, so I got a contract from the regulator to go and look at how do other industries select and train and assess their on-scene commanders, their incident commanders. And that's what led me into this whole area of psychology where there was work going on, particularly in the US after the Vincennes incident, where you remember a cruiser shot down, a US Aegis cruiser accidentally shot down a passenger airliner um, and um, there was a huge um, body of work commissioned after that to look at how commanders make decisions under pressure. So this is the, the background um, to much of this research has come from some very large accidents. Um, and the work we did on that project was written up in a number of texts. I think the hot seat book's still available. It's probably a bit out of date. But, but we did the work we did, we wrote up because we're academics and that's how we do things. So what is situation awareness? Can you put your, I know you don't like putting your hands up from the previous question, but can, how many people know this term and, or use this term, situation awareness? Oh, quite a few. Oh, right, okay, more than I thought. So I'll not need to spend long on this. So this is knowing what's going on around you, essentially. There's three components in the, in the system, if effectively picking up the information, making sense of it, and anticipating what, what would happen next. Pilots talk about flying ahead of the plane. Fast jet pilots say, if you know where you are now, it's too late because you were there five miles ago. So in fast moving dynamic situations, you really need to be ahead of the curve and systems people I've worked with say that's also true in, in your world. So some of the big accidents, we're seeing situation awareness now being completely flagged as part of the a causal chain in the accident, Deepwater Horizon, Macondo I've mentioned, and this is the drilling crew being criticized for having inadequate situation awareness, thinking an oil well that they had just drilled was safe when in fact it was anything but safe. And there were a whole set of warning signs coming back from the well. The well was talking to them, as the drillers say, to tell them this isn't sealed, this isn't safe, and the hydrocarbons are gonna come up that well, and which is what happened. There's a little other point here about I don't, I don't know how this applies in your world, but in industry, in other industries where we've got a big accident, the lawyers and the investigators get hold of all the emails. 
Emails are a very powerful uh, source of information, as you might imagine. And this is a quote from one of the reports uh, from one of the engineers. Um, so you can imagine, you know, this is kind of normal conversation. But when these emails end up on the front page of the New York Times, that might be an email you wish you hadn't sent. Um, so one of the pieces here in terms of situation awareness is how do you judge risk? And there is a literature on this, but there's some interesting work in dynamic dynamic uh, tasks such as flying the plane. And this is some work, I think this could probably apply in your world. These are what are called plan continuation errors where you stay with the plan too long. And you've stayed with the plan too long because you've not rejudged the risk. You've done some calculation as to how much risk there's here, but the situation's changing. And your situation awareness hasn't been quite as good as it might have been because you've not continued to reevaluate the risk. And in simulator studies at NASA with pilots where they put them in particular scenarios, they began to see an effect where it was clear that people were so motivated to finish the task that their risk perception seemed to be subservient in some ways to the motivation, which is to finish the task, i.e. finish the flight, and they called this a plan continuation error, where the nearer you got to the destination, you could almost see your destination, the less likely they were to make a divert decision. And this is to do with situation awareness, this is to do with risk assessment, and this is probably true in your world, where the fix looks like it's just 10 minutes off, and you are so nearly there. But there are some warning signs that you may be going in the right direction. <clears throat> the fix may not be entirely appropriate. But the fact that you can see the end of the task, which is very attractive and motivating for humans, causes you to stay with that plan. And coming off the plan is going to be more work, more cognitive load. But actually, sometimes that's the, going to be the right answer. So we can see, I'm just trying to illustrate some of the research that's being done studying some of these decision problems. Uh, this one is from Gwandi, who's a surgeon at Harvard, who's written a number of books, which you may have read, like Complications, I think this might be from. Atul Gwandi, and this is, I think, a very nice, this is a quote from some of his writing, showing that even when you've made the decision, you still need to keep your situation awareness antennae up, as it were. And what he's describing here, then, is having decided that the, the, there's an issue here about cutting the right duct in gallbladder surgery, which sometimes, because the anatomy is complex there, sometimes the wrong duct gets cut by mistake. The patient then needs to have additional surgery. And he's just described in this example about, they were just about to cut it, the clip, and suddenly something just caught his attention and it didn't look quite right. And this, I think, is the kind of hallmark of expertise we're trying to capture. What is it that the experts do? And in this case, is having made the decision, they're still watching, they're still alert for, for um, risk. And so there's models of situation awareness, there's companies like Micah Ensley's company, SA Technologies, who specialize in designing for good situation awareness, training for good situation awareness, and that's the sort of basic model here that we can, we can unpick. And one of the components, as I say, is picking up the information, and then the next bit is how do you make sense of that information? And we can only store so much information in our heads at any one time in terms of being conscious of it. And psychologists call this working memory. So as you may be aware, there's more than one memory store. There's a huge big store where, where we have everything that we know about. But there's an important store, which is essentially the contents of our consciousness. It's like our desktop. At any one moment in time, humans cannot attend to more than a limited number of things. And that desktop store, that working memory store, <clears throat> is, is limited in capacity, and it is also very fragile. And it's very easy to do simple experiments when you're training this stuff, just to illustrate to people how fragile this store can be. You think about holding a 10-digit telephone number in your head as you walk through the building. What is it you don't want to happen? Well, for most people, they don't want somebody to interrupt them and speak to them because the number may just wipe right out. And that's an illustration of the number being held consciously, repeating it, focusing on it to maintain it in working memory. 
And so when you're training this kind of stuff, you, you, we do a bit of the psychology here about the architecture of cognition, because if people understand the architecture of their memory system a bit better, it understands why distraction and interruption in teams, for example, can be um, very detrimental, even for the smartest people. It shows that for all of us, our capacity is, is limited and we have to protect that, in particularly in higher demand situations. So there's a bunch of stuff you can take from the science that you apply into practical tips and techniques and uh, training methods that, that you use in those situations. And it used to be we would teach, I learned as an undergraduate, that the capacity of working, of short-term memory, it was called then, was the magical number seven plus or minus two. But actually, that's for very limited information bits like single digits. If you look at chunks of information, the neurological evidence shows now that the capacity for most people is more like four. And so that's not very much information to be holding simultaneously and thinking about it in your head at one moment in time. So that's a wee bit of the kind of science we would use to underpin our, our teaching in this area. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the gorilla video with the basketball and, and everybody staring at the basketball game and uh, hey presto, a gorilla has been there and half the room have missed it. I've done this with surgeons who have completely been astonished that they could miss something so enormous. Somebody told me they did it with fighter pilots once who were appalled and said he'd shown them two different videos, which he hadn't because their lives depended on seeing. Anyway, these, these inattentional blindness um, phenomena, this is where you're so busy looking at one thing that's of great interest to you, you miss some other thing that is there in plain sight walking across or in the middle of your viewing. This is an adaptation for visual information adapted for um, radiologists studying films of x-rays and they put a drawing of a gorilla and a huge number of them missed this when they were looking for something else. They're looking for tumor nodules, so that's very important, but there was something else there. And so there's a whole set of demonstrations of this and some more recent work, maybe more relevant for your world when you're on conference calls, you're maybe not, you're using you're listening, you can miss information when you're listening for one thing and something else happens. And there's some people studying this now um, in auditory attention, how we can have inattentional blindness too. Okay, good, yeah. yeah. It happens in everybody's world, it happens to us. You know, and you think, how could I possibly not have seen that? Um, and so, yeah, I'm sure, that, I'm sure it can happen with code or happen listening in on a call, whatever. So the, the next bit of this whole process is you, you've picked up the information, you've had good situation awareness in terms of gathering the right information and attending to it, but then you've got to create the right picture. And we know we get accidents where people gathered information but then formed the wrong mental model. And sometimes when you form the wrong mental model, if you quite like that model and you're, you spent some time building it, then you can be quite reluctant to give that model up. And this, is called, this can be called confirmation bias, where new information that's coming in that tells you, you've got the wrong model here, you're not listening to it, you explain it away because you're so fond of the model you've already built, your understanding of the situation, that you then distort information coming in and explain it away. This is what happened on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig. They had all these anomalous signs coming and then one of the drillers said, ah, I think this is a bladder effect, that's why we've got this. Nobody had ever heard of a bladder effect, it then transpires, but they explained away Understandably, I'm not blaming this is what people do typically in these situations. So we can see lots of events where this has happened. One of the ones I particularly like is this one. It's quite an old one, but it's a Northwest Airlines uh, DC-1040 carrying passengers from Detroit to Frankfurt. Passengers who presumably thought that they would land in Frankfurt, but actually ended up landing in Brussels. Now, I know European countries look very tiny to you if you come from the great big United States of America, but actually, you know, they're not that close and we do expect our pilots to land in the correct country. That's usually helpful. And 
the pilots in this example were the only, this is a teamwork issue here, the pilots uh, were the only people unaware of the detour because some people are looking out the window and some passengers are watching the data, the data show and then saying to the stewardess, this is a good number of years ago, saying to the cabin crew, uh, this looks like uh, we're heading for Belgium rather than Germany. And apparently cabin crew said, oh, don't worry about that. That's just for entertainment because they hadn't been given the key information that the data show in those days was actually coming from flight instruments. But nobody in the back speaks up and says anything to the flight deck. The same happened in the um, accident where they shut down the wrong engine because one was in fire. People in the back could see which engine was on fire. The pilots said what they were doing and it didn't really add up, but nobody in the cabin crew wanted to disturb the pilots when they were dealing with an emergency. So they said, oh, they must have meant right when they said left. I mean, you couldn't possibly get that wrong in, the, in an unfolding disaster, but of course people can. So this whole issue about in teams speaking up and challenging, which is not easy to do, is a big piece. Anyway, the media absolutely loved this. The airline, in fairness, uh, treated it as an accident, I, uh, even though there was no accident. It was a bit of a surprise for the uh, air traffic controllers uh, when they got the unexpected DC-10 arriving. And what had happened here was, it was there was issues to do with the controller information, but the pilots had sort of explained away what appeared to be slightly anomalous information, as had the controllers, thinking, that doesn't sound right, but it must be. Anyway, what this is what happened, and the airline did an analysis. And the media just loved this. So this was Herald Tribune after uh, the event, um, making the point. Okay, so how do you manage this? What are the implications? You might want to protect situation awareness. You may want to train situation awareness. You know, these may be fundamental skills. You may be learning tricks or tips rather than uh, affecting your cognitive capacity. But there are things and other industries are, are looking at these skills and they're training them. Okay, so decision making. There's this situation awareness thing going on all the time when information changes and we think, ah, the situation has changed, I need to assess the situation. You may now need to be working out what is the problem here, what is the issue, and then making a decision. And so there's a whole bunch of research here, particularly what's called naturalistic decision research that looks at real worlds like military, aviation, your kind of world, to look at how people do this. And we know that there's a number of different ways people make decisions, so there's very fast, intuitive ways Psychologists sometimes call this recognition prime decision making. It's pattern recognition. Oh, I've seen this before. I know what to do. There's rule based where you just follow written rules and procedures. There's analytical, which is much more heavy duty thinking where you're really going to be using working memory a lot to figure out what is the problem and what could we do about it here? And there's situations where you have to kind of work out things from first principle. And we can go through, I'm not going to do this, but you can go through these and look at how these, how these particular um, types of decision making are used in your world. And do people switch mode? You would use all these methods normally, but are you using the right method for the right situation? Some of you may have read Kahneman's book on thinking fast, thinking slow. And that's what this is about. This kind of psychology is now attracting popular attention. So we can put these on a continuum. For the analytical, we need much more cognitive power. We need much more working memory, which means it's prone to distraction, prone to interference. And uh, stress has a bigger impact on that um, because you know, you're trying to concentrate, you're trying to think, and if your stress level's rising, that's not going to make it easier. So really in many domains, they want to train people so they can make fast, intuitive decisions under pressure by recognizing key features of the situation and knowing what to do. So I wanted to just show a little two-bit illustration. You've maybe seen this, it's on the web, but this is Sully, the airline pilot who did the pretty impressive landing on the Hudson River. And this is a, a, a graphic representation, but you can hear some of the um, conversation here between him and the controller. And when I've played this before to systems analysts who work on conference calls and solve problems in that way, they were very interested in particularly the, the 
economy and efficiency and calmness of the communication. In fact, in one company, they went off to talk to air traffic controllers to look at how they learned to do this. So don't just listen to the pilot, listen to the, the controller as well, um, who is also uh, not having the best morning of his career as he starts to get this message. So if we could play the video now. Jack is 1549-700, climbing 5,000. Jack is 1549-0, departure to contact, climb maintain 1-5,000. Maintain 1-5,000, Jack is 1549-0. Cactus 1549, turn left lane 270. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539, hit first, lost thrust, and both hits returning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading of uh, 220. 220. Tire, stop your departure, he's got emergency returning. Cactus 1529, he, uh, bird strike, he lost all engine, he lost the thrust in the engines, he's returning immediately. Cactus 1529, which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Cactus 1529, we can get it for you. Do you want to try to land 1913? We're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. All right, Cactus 1549, it's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, Empire, actually, LaGuardia departure guy, emergency inbound. Hey, go ahead. Cactus 1529 over the George Washington Bridge wants to go to the airport right now. Wants to go to the airport. Check. Does he need assistance? Uh, yes. He, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for uh, runway 1? Runway 1. That's good. Cactus 1529, turn right 280. You can land runway right. 1 at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay. Which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. I'm sorry. Say again, Cactus. Cactus 1549, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Eagle 5, 4718, turn left thing 210. 210, uh, 4718. I don't know, I think he said he was going to the Hudson. Cactus 1529, uh, Houston. Okay, so uh, you may have seen that before. It's, it's, it's on the, on the um, web, my permission to show it. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there if you're, if you're going to talk about non-technical skills. And there's teamwork going on that we can't hear with the, the two pilots on the, on the flight deck. Um, this is clearly technically a stunning performance, but it is notable, I think, that uh, the pilot, the captain here, has a psychology master's degree as well. And he was also a trainer of non-technical skills of crew resource management in his airline. So I don't want to claim complete credit for the psychology piece here, but, you know, because his flying skills weren't bad either. But, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting example, particularly when, when we can hear the tape. And there's that wonderful laconic bit where some other pilot who's on the same frequency casually says, oh, I think he's going in, he says he's going in the Hudson. But you could, the controller's still offering uh, the pilot options, which is the right thing for the controller to be doing, but the pilot has made, I've heard him speak, and some of the AV guys here say they've heard him speak as well, and some of you may have heard that captain speak, that he, 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 I heard him talk to the Human Factors Conference uh, here in America, and he said um, he was aware that he had to task shed, that he is only going to be able to control a small amount of information and to think about that, and he consciously quickly decided what was key to think about and what he had to try and not think about. And it's a great demonstration there. But the controller's behavior, that's a very calm controller uh, continuing to try and support that um, pilot in a kind of amazing situation. Okay, so what can happen? This is a very nice example of very calm decision making. Not all of us end up like that. And so there's a whole bunch of other things we know about what can happen when people get stressed. And there's lots of individual differences here and it may depend on other factors. So I'm not gonna go through these, but you may have seen some of these other things um, happen during decision making. I came across this recently, just this week, I saw somebody writing about this, which I thought was a really neat idea. The Rugby uh, World Cup is about to start in the UK. And uh, this was a very nice example of they hadn't been doing too well, the All Blacks, the New Zealand team, and they brought in this forensic psychiatrist to look at emotion and cognition and trying to understand how they could avoid 
choking or, or getting too emotionally tied into the situation and then not being able to think clearly. And they came up with this thing about keeping a blue head, which I think is a great idea. And I've seen this in other industries. I've seen police officers who do pursuit driving being told to avoid red mist is when they get so annoyed that they follow the other car at any cost. They have to also try and keep cool so that they can, so that the emotion doesn't get in the way of your decision making. And there's some nice examples here about what these rugby players are doing under stress and they're big tough guys feeling stress uh, like doing things like stamping your feet or moving back and I've been working with surgeons talking to them about how they make decisions while they're operating and sometimes these are very critical decisions and they talk about doing things like standing back even just an inch or two from the operating table so that they can clear their head and, and think and get a bigger picture and not be too locked into the task. So it's interesting, experts have developed their own methods and some of you may have your own taking a deep breath, standing, but doing something else, moving your visual attention um, to try and control emotion that may be getting in the way of clear cognition. Uh, failures in team decision making, I want to say a little bit about teamwork, there's a massive literature in this, some of it's quite interesting reading, of course psychologists love things going terribly badly wrong and then they can analyse it, we probably don't spend enough time analysing and when things went well, but we can see all kinds of uh, different problems here and the one I'm going to talk about is um, just briefly is status hierarchy. So this, I'll just move back, this is where in any work environment I've ever been in, there is some kind of status hierarchy that some people are more senior, some people are more expert, some people have more power than others, and these status effects affect behavior. They particularly affect the behavior of the people who are lower status because they can be hesitant to speak up and challenge. And before when I've worked with people in your world, they say this can happen in outage resolution, that people who think they may know a solution or they've seen something or whatever, are hesitant to mention this, maybe because nobody asked them or they think they don't have an ex enough expertise or some loudmouth expert person is saying all the time what the problem is and not listening to other people. So you can have these status effects in any workplace. And the, the slide I was going on to here to introduce this, this is work NASA again were doing with airline pilots. We knew there had been a whole series of accidents where co-pilots were hesitant to speak up and challenge captains. There was a BBC television program on this and one of the psychologists said uh, co-pilots would rather die than criticize a captain. And of course there's 300 people sitting behind the co-pilot who are going with him, so or her. So the airlines from the 70s onwards started to do a whole lot of work on this. I was astonished when I found that British Airways were teaching pilots in assertiveness. I mean, they don't look like guys who need assertiveness training to me, but actually you have to teach the junior people in assertiveness and you have to teach the senior people to listen because there's no point in having assertive juniors if the seniors then don't listen to them or are rude to them. So, you know, you need to train everybody here. And this is this example of this hinting and hoping behavior that people of lower status often do. You may have done this yourself earlier in your career where you don't really want to directly challenge so you, you, you say some things and hope the more senior person takes the hint. And this is just a, this is just a lab experiment. Um, scenario is given to um, captains and first officers. These are uh, US pilots. Um, and they just looked at what the language was. They, they said, what would you say if you're in this situation, you know, it's a two person crew, what would you say to the other pilot? And the captains were, were giving statements that were very direct, whereas the co-pilots were giving these ooh, much more mitigated speech, much more cautious statements, maybe not completely sure, or just maybe not wanting to be seen to be challenging. And we know there's been a number of accidents and one of the most significant ones was here into the Potomac River which some of you may remember an Air Florida flight in 1982 and there's a whole the, the plane was ice was began to ice up the pilots were not terribly used to flying in these conditions apparently and the the there's a little bit of the voice tape there in the in the blue where the first officer is kind of hinting he's not happy with the situation but the you know the captain uh, isn't really picking this up and that was very much analyzed 
by the investigators afterwards. And one of the illustrations about needing to make sure co-pilots were really assertive uh, when need be. And if you're working in cross-cultural teams, then some cultures, Far Eastern cultures compared to Western cultures, have even stronger status hierarchies. So people may be even less um, able and willing to speak up because that just doesn't happen in their culture and you have to address that and some of the airlines do very specific stuff on this because they're flying with multicultural crews nowadays and this is another one a Korean air one where the language of the first officer don't you think it rains more in this area here I mean this is what we've put on this but there was another meaning because it looked like one could make an assumption that that uh, he was trying to tell the captain about an impending problem. Okay, so to train decision making, understanding these cognitive processes, giving people structured exposure so that they can practice these skills, a lot of simulation used in other worlds now, debriefing, but debriefing the non-technical skills as well as the technical skills. You can use low fidelity tools for this and doing good analysis of incidents uh, tells you what skills you need to be training in your teams. And so my final slide then is, uh, you know, can you identify the non-technical skills for people in your world? Is that relevant? Maybe, maybe this is not relevant in, in your world. Um, how do we select people who are going to take more leadership roles in outage resolution? How do we train them? How do you, have, how do you uh, judge whether your training's uh, being effective and they'll be able to really show these skills on the day? And do you have processes in place in your organizations for uh, competence assurance of non-technical skills, because this is what we see now in the airline industry, in the nuclear power industry. We're seeing this coming in, in in areas like surgery, where people are identifying the skills, making the frameworks, developing the training, and then using that as part of their whole professional development. And so that's my um, pitch on non-technical skills that may or may not be relevant for your world, but um, thank you very much for your attention. If you want any more information, you could email me uh, or uh, some of these tools are on these, um, more access for the tools and the scientific papers are on these um, websites. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions if, if um, anybody wants to ask anything. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like a lot of these principles help apply in uh, planning, uh, planning and development of teams as well as operations. I, I know you, you're talking about this more from the perspective from uh, uh, planning and development of teams and operations. And now we're going to see this in the minimal stuff. It could also apply to, say, a lot of software projects that you know, have, have all these implementation issues. Yeah, sure. I mean, they, they, they apply in all kinds of situations. And really, what in some of the simulation centers, they call this crisis avoidance. It's not just about, you know, the outage stuff is very salient, and clearly you need the same skills at a high level. But actually, what most industries are interested in is are not getting into crisis situations in the first place, and trying to identify good skills in teams and individuals who make up those teams for keeping out of crisis emergency situations if, if they can, because they know from their accident analysis this is part of what's got them in there or why things haven't been picked up and resolved quickly enough. Yeah, you'll need to shout probably. <laughs> Okay, so some of it is just about understanding your own processes a bit better, understanding what, what affects that both for you and, and in the team. So quite a lot of this is about self-awareness. And a little big piece of this is about understanding your limitations as a human. This was a big deal in the aviation industry in the probably 60s, 70s as they started working on this, where the attitudinal work and some of the interview work 
um, showed that pilots had completely unrealistic conceptions about their mental capacity, how stress affected them, how fatigue affected them, clearly thinking that they were superhuman. Subsequent work in the 80s and 90s with surgeons also showed, you know, I can work 36 hours. And, uh, and so quite a lot of this is about self-awareness, is, is understanding human performance limitations. And pilots in most com countries have to take an exam in HPL, human performance limitations, before they even get their first license. So some of it's self-awareness. And then some of it, I think if you have this skill set identified or a prototype identified, and people start by looking at tools like the surgical one or the anesthesiology one, and they take it and they look at it and they think, oh, OK, this stuff's relevant, this isn't. You know, and they, they use that as the, as the starting point to going and doing some of the same investigative work themselves to build their own, build their own tools. But you're right, in, in a high pressure situation, you do want people to be doing things fairly automatically and engaging in behaviors that are going to be facilitative and hopefully suppressing behaviors like interrupting people who are in the middle of thinking about something. You know, just trying to, to produce more of the right behaviors and less of the wrong ones. If you're using simulation, that's a great way of giving people feedback on those behavior patterns. Can you speak up a wee bit? Oh, okay. Sure, okay. If I understand you correctly, this is about how do you speak up? How do you, how do you challenge, particularly if it's your boss, particularly if it's expert? So I think this is a cultural thing. So what we've seen, and, and this is not easy, and, and I'm not pretending that it is. And I will also have been in situations where I didn't speak up and it might have been wise to do so. So, so first of all, it's a cultural thing. And that's a, that's a really important point. You can do this kind of training in organizations and yet if the culture is toxic, nobody will produce those behaviors. So you kind of need to think about, is the culture going to support junior people speaking up, for example? Um, so as I say, you need to have senior people also trained so that they're more receptive to some of these cues that somebody's not completely happy. And, uh, and they do briefings at the beginning of the flight, for example, or the beginning of the surgical procedure saying, I am not a superhero. If you see something going wrong, I want you to tell me. So little tiny things like that start to give other people in the team permission to speak up, start to make, they, they talk about flattening the status gradient, and that gives people a little bit more confidence to speak up. Then what we've, we've seen in other industries is they start training people in the skills, because you might want to speak up, but you don't quite know the best way to do that. And they have what they call graded, graded assertiveness, and there are certain words they train them to use, so they're training, uh, trainee surgeons to do this just now, where, where you start by kind of saying, um, I'm, a, I'm a bit concerned with this. You're using key trigger words, uh, or I'm a bit worried about this. Or, and then ultimately, you have to use the word stop if you're really concerned. And this is, and this is um, you know, what you have to do to try and take over the situation. But it's not easy. And, and co-pilots would say, you know, Maybe that will endanger the flight if I irritate the, the, the captain too much. So this is not entirely easy. But other industries are addressing this and are trying, to, are trying to train for it. And actually talking about it explicitly and acknowledging that these things go on is a big part of changing the culture. Oh, this, sorry.
So this is in, in teams, what's the behavior you're, you're concerned about? Okay, in response to a, a, a crisis situation in terms of working with the team? I'm not quite hearing the, que the question. Oh, defensiveness in response to criticism. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I think, and I, I think this is, you know, there's no, there's no straightforward um, way to just fix this in a, in a moment. These are normal human uh, behaviors, protective behaviors that many people will engage in. Um, what I think, I'm, I can only speak about what I see other industries doing is um, where there are more structured ways of, of debriefing where people are trained to debrief in supportive ways, for example, um, that then starts to make it easier to, for people to make critical comments in a safe, psychologically safe environment. So there are some tools and techniques companies are using, I can come and speak, you know, to try and, and allow those kinds of criticisms to be, to be if, you're, if you're doing this after the event, for example, in a, in a debrief situation. So the skills you need in the heat of the moment may be kind of different from the skills that are used afterwards. But again, it's often teaching communication skills explicitly to, to help do that. That makes it easier for both parties, the person receiving the the criticism and the person giving it. And it depends on your company culture. Is that a normal thing? You know, you look at, at airline pilots or fast jet pilots, military pilots, they, they debrief after every operation and that has criticism in it and people accept that. And when I worked before in the bank with the systems analysts, they started listening to each other's calls and doing debriefing and they said it's a bit difficult at first because we don't really like uh, doing the criticism, but if we've got the framework, it's kind of helpful. So you're not saying you did this wrong. You can focus on the exact skills and talk about the skills rather than talking about the person, which seems to make it a little bit easier to give that because most people can't improve their performance unless they get some of that kind of feedback occasionally.